thank you for having me, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Just for the record, uh, my name is Bo Yang, and I am the Executive Director and Legal Counsel for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And first, I'd like to introduce you to Amanda Garces, who was just in here. <laughs> she is um, our newest Director of Policy, Education, and Outreach. And so she will be doing the lion's share. Amanda, I just introduced you. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. She will actually be doing the lion's share of a lot of policy work over here. And of course, I'll still be around as well. Uh, we'll be working on that together. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that, this good news. And many of you may remember, but Amanda's position was supported by the legislature last year. And so that was a really big push, and I really appreciate everybody who voted to make that happen. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Um, I thought that at first I should probably talk a little bit about the difference between the Human Rights Commission and um, the Attorney General's Office's Civil Rights Unit so that you know what we have jurisdiction over. So um, our agency has jurisdiction over claims of discrimination in three primary areas, housing, state government employment, and places of public accommodation. And so housing can be anything like someone uh, was denied housing because of a protected status or neighbor-on-neighbor -neighbor harassment because of a protected status, et cetera. Uh, places of public accommodations is a huge area, and that could include prisons, uh, roads. That also includes hospitals, schools, and basically any business that provides goods and services to the general public. And then state government employment. So for any state employee uh, who b have, believes that they have a claim of discrimination, they would be filing a complaint at the Human Rights Commission. So Julio Thompson heads the Civil Rights Unit of the Attorney General's Office, and I'm sure you all are familiar with him. And they do all private employment as well as any municipality employment cases. Um, in addition to that, they have jurisdiction over the hate crimes, which is the statute that is being proposed here today. And so I am a big believer that any time um, someone has jurisdiction over a statute, that they are probably the go-to entity and agency. And I think Julio would do the same whenever a bill comes up that impacts our statute as well. And so that's the first thing I'd like to say. The second thing I'd like to offer here is that H-496 was a bill that showed up in a letter of a concern last year from various constituents, many of whom are from protected categories or represent members of protected categories, and they had raised a concern about 496 uh, partly because of process and wanting to have input in that bill and how it comes about and uh, partly because I think they said that the language was just fundamentally flawed. I was not a part of those conversations or a signatory to that letter, so I can't say entirely what the intent or motivation or all the concerns are, so I don't want to uh, represent what those are. Um, I would just say that this is probably a bill that should be more uh, reflective of the people and also as if you move forward to be mindful of the people that need to be heard on this bill so that's probably really important um, the other thing is too that I'm not entirely sure that changing the word hate to the word bias really has a practical impact whether there is going, whether it'll truly be applied in a different way. I believe that the sponsor of this bill definitely had good intent and wanted there to be um, more of an open door, but I'm not sure that in practice that there is a significant difference between the term bias motivated versus hate motivated. And again, I would refer you to the Attorney General's office's testimony on that bill. So because they again have jurisdiction over it and they'll know what was what would be included if we change it to bias. I'm not sure that I do know. So um, I want to be respectful of that. 
Having said that, for what it's worth, so we neither support nor really uh, not support the bill. I just, those were the concerns that the Human Rights Commission had. And also that if um, we're spending time and energy on a bill that may not necessarily translate to real practical changes for the people that are most vulnerable in Vermont, there are many bills right now that have been introduced that I think are those bills that do change people's lives. S83 is one of those bills. That's a bill that seeks to uh, prohibit employers from punishing people who have filed complaints of discrimination. And one of the ways in which they punish those folks is they, during a settlement agreement, they will uh, include a clause um, or insist on a clause that prevents that employee from ever reapplying for work again. And that's very problematic at the state of Vermont because we employ about 7,000 or 8,000 people. Um, and also, state government is supposed to be one of the most inclusive places to work. Um, so if you prohibit, um, let's say, an African-American person who has filed a complaint of discrimination from reapplying for work at the state, you're closing the door to a lot of places and many times we've heard directly from people who have said, I just want to leave the state of Vermont. Um, and so that is a really important bill. Another really important bill also is um, H556, which is the gender neutral bathroom amendment bill. Uh, we've had some trouble ensuring compliance um, and uh, on a, for the, for the majority of respondents that we have reached out to and have found to have violate the law or have heard are in violation of the gender neutral bathroom law, we've had good compliance with those folks. But there are a few people who have ignored um, community members as well as the HRC's uh, request to have them come into compliance. And so H556 actually does a little bit more to maybe assess a fine and also appropriates a little bit of money to the Human Rights Commission to do a public ad campaign to get everybody on board about the um, bill. There's also several other bills out there that are really good too and um, I just wanted to highlight those too. Uh, having said that, there are many states across the country that are doing some really interesting bias um, um, stuff. Um, Oregon is one of those. I think they recently revised their bias crime law to provide more clear guidance about data collection. They um, had a bill that was seeking to penalize people who made um, unnecessary 911 calls on um, people who are from protected categories, primarily white people calling on African Americans for sitting in a cafe or sitting <coughs> in a, a lounge at the college or barbecuing in a park. Those are the kinds of incidents that kind of um, triggered this, these types of bills. And I think something like that would be really interesting and could capture a lot of that bias stuff. Um, <coughs> Having some standardization around bias incident reporting would be potentially helpful, but that's something that the AG's office and the Human Rights Commission are committed to doing regardless whether there's a bill or not, but something that we can continue to have a conversation with all of you about as well. Um, so, yeah. Yes, please. Uh -huh. My question has to do with the difference between hate motivated and bias motivated. Um, you had mentioned that it wouldn't really create any practical changes. I was wondering if you feel that would apply to the police or the attorneys or both of them, or if you could just expand a bit more on that. Sure. Well, we um, both, perhaps, because we certainly know that the police have a lot of discretion when they're um, being called to respond to an incident. Uh, but also the prosecutors have a lot of discretion when they're deciding whether to charge an incident that comes from the police. And so um, it certainly could apply to both. I'm not sure that the, I, I, I don't know if I can speak on behalf of the police, but I think as an attorney, I'm not sure that a crime that is motivated by bias is that much different from a crime that is motivated by, by hate. Um, I just don't know if it has a legal impact in the courtroom, okay. too. Yeah. 
It might change the way the police look at crimes, but I can't speak on behalf of the police. I'm not sure, yeah, to be honest. Um, a couple questions. Well, one is with respect to H-496, and if you have any input on, th there's really two components to, mm -hmm. to the bill. And I'm looking at Section 9, which uh, <coughs> creates a civil penalty and the cause of action for violation of constitutional rights. And yeah. I don't know if you had a chance to look at that. Do you have any input on that? I did. Um, I, I think that's a, it definitely seemingly a very good idea. Uh, I just think I would seek more clarification. And again, the person, the entity that has jurisdiction over that is the AG's office and how they would apply that. When um, what that comes to mind or what that brings to mind is obviously the incidents with um, the hate that happened with um, Kaya Morris, representative, former representative Kaya Morris, and that how if we had had that, um, that could have been something that um, the Bennington police or the um, prosecutors down there could have used to, to, to find um, the racist individual that who was harassing her in violation of. Uh, but I also think that there were already plenty of laws in place, too, that also could have been used, too. So, um, but yeah. Right. So, um, a couple of others. Uh, one point I just wanted for clarification, and yeah. then, then I had another question as well, is that, <clears throat> yeah, there, there was, this was shelved last year because of that letter, letter. because of pushback. And I was hoping that over the off session, some people would get together and kind of understand what we should go with this. And, and that didn't really happen, so what we're trying to do is certainly, yeah. all right, we're bringing this back and, and we're trying to reach out to make sure anybody wants to comment on yeah. this bill. And it's going to yeah. probably, I mean, it's going to change. You know, sure. That's the way the bills are. Mm -hmm. But I just want to make very clear that we're trying to have this. An off session is not always the best time to get input on a bill mm -hmm. in, in a coordinated, on the right kind of fashion. So that's what we're trying to offer anybody who wants to comment on, on this bill. Sure. The other thing is, do you have any, are there any bills within the Judiciary Committee? If, yeah, I don't know if you've had a chance to look through those, and if you could, mm -hmm. and points, what, point whatever out that you think would help, because the other bills you mentioned are great bills, but yeah. we have little yes. input yes. on I mean, we do have a data gathering bill, which, which I think we've had some good input would be helpful yeah. in the criminal justice um, system. But. I wish I could say, uh, but I don't have. Uh, no, no, you don't have to look. I'm just yes. if you can get back to us if there are particular bills that. I will definitely be mindful. We we um, follow bills by their subject matter, mm -hmm. and then we'll follow it through the committee. But um, certainly, I'll take a look at that, and we'd be happy to respond to you about that. Um, I think that we have to be mindful in committee to invite people who are the voices of the people who are impacted by it. So oftentimes, and I'm happy to be here, I, I en enjoy being here, and I certainly think we see a lot of those people, and I hope that we do a fair job of representing those voices. But I also think um, to what you were saying is that uh, we should also be reaching out to those folks to show up in committee to testify. Um, one, because many of them are working full-time jobs, and they're not available from eight to four thirty when we're usually here doing uh, taking testimony. And so um, I would encourage you to invite those folks in here to testify as well. Yeah. And if you are seeking well one, there's a list of names on the letter, but if you're seeking actually other people, then I certainly would be happy to see if I could provide some of those names as well. Yes. Um, do you think this is a, well, I'm, so I'm sort of weighing the, like, um, what I heard you say, which is, and, may, and maybe if the bill is amended, it, we can address some of your concerns about what it really does, you know, like if it does enough to merit spending a lot of time on it. Um, but I'm just wondering, so I, I'm wondering if there would be any value in having a public hearing on this bill or... And maybe, if, and maybe if there's other kind of um, related bills in our committee, just 
to get outside of that like sure. eight to five kind of window mm -hmm. that we tend to operate in, in here. But I but I feel like maybe that's a little at odds with what I'm hearing you say about the tension of like your position of like I'm not sure this is the bill you should be spending time on. Is what I heard a little bit in your testimony. Because I want to um, make sure I got that right. Yes. Yeah. That that definitely is what I said. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I think that our focus at the Human Rights Commission is to bring about real change that has practical impact, mm -hmm. right? And not just legalese or changing verbiage if it doesn't translate to something that really impacts people's lives. I think more importantly, I have a question for the people, for all of you, and for the sponsors of this bill is what was the goal in changing the verbiage from hate to bias, and what are we including that was previously excluded? Because that's where I didn't get, but that's because I don't have jurisdiction over it, so I don't see those cases. But my understanding from talking to Julio Thompson is that it it doesn't capture that, that those cases. And so if you, if I hear that we were trying to change the verbiage from hate to bias so that we can include incidents like this, then I think I could go, well then here's an amendment to the bill, or mm -hmm. here's a better bill that captures those cases, uh, whereas this one, a court might interpret it all sorts of way. And, but I think I don't quite know, and we didn't really spend the time, you're right, outside of the legislative session on what was the thought and thinking behind this bill and what were we trying to uh, capture that the hate bias bill, I mean the hate crime bill right now doesn't capture. So I don't, I don't know, that might be something you can answer. I, yeah. I, yeah, I will, I'll hide on that. Um, so Ideas for bills come from all over the place, yeah. as, as we know. Yeah. Um, and, and the idea for that component of this bill came from um, from James Lawton, yeah. uh, Kaya's husband. In, in the last the beginning of the last session, I was talking to him a lot sure. about what can we do in this right. situation. Yeah. And he had yeah. seen these changes in another state in the bill and mm -hmm. said, it sounds good to me. And, and so I put <coughs> a request for the bill. And, and we both recognized, James and I, that it wasn't significantly changing the substance, mm -hmm. it, you know, but it was changing kind of uh, how one might look at it mm -hmm. as far as that bias can be different than hate. Yeah. But the more the more important, I think since then we've both thought, James and I, and whether this is worth it, mm -hmm. that the more important component in that is getting rid of maliciously as a qualifier that has to be maliciously motivated. <coughs> sure. I mean, if it's hate, you know, yeah. Why do you have to show that it's, or if it's bias, why do you have to show that it's malicious hate or bias? It mm -hmm. seems you know, redundant and just an extra thing that has to be shown. Sure. But that's how this, that particular yeah. component. So it wasn't necessarily this deep, long, thought out process. It's like, James and I thought, well, this is something we're throwing out there to, yeah. to hear about. So I think that also brings up um, the conversation that we had earlier about who are we targeting in terms of how they're seeing this. And so coming from a legal perspective, I don't think a judge would see the terminology differently. Yeah. But it might be that a police officer might respond to incidents differently if the word bias showed up than hate. But again, <coughs> then we need to hear from officers about and what does that look like and how would that translate uh, when they're on the streets and they're responding to an incident. And if we think that the police are not considering all crimes that by, might be bias motivated because of the word hate, then I think that's a matter of training, policy changes, and also um, uh, doing more with our police officers about capturing that. Um, and so I think there's room there certainly for improvement. I, I don't know really, I don't have the expertise on whether the police would be review, seeing things differently based on that. I think we have a hard enough time having the police even capture hate. And I don't think that's a matter of because of the verbiage in the law. I think that um, sometimes hate is um, one, I think, ugh, well, I'll just be transparent. <laughs> sometimes I think that maybe they don't take hate that seriously. Um, or we seem to be less nervous about people who are spewing hate, but we somehow, when the hate is based on race or gender identity, 
or a protected status, but we're less, but we're more scared if the hate is based on uh, someone's status. Um, so, for example, um, a person of color calls the police and says, I'm really afraid of this white person who has been posting all of these really negative things about me and then I've seen their cars a few times and I'm really scared about that. The police might take that less seriously than a white person that says there's a really strange African American in my neighborhood and I don't know if he belongs here or not and the police go, oh, okay, I'll come over there and check that out. That is not about verbiage. That is about something different. And we, there's a lot of possibilities here on how to address that. The fair and impartial policing bill is one of those. Um, but there's, there's, poss there's possibilities here to address that. But see, I don't think that that's because they went to the statute and said this is not a hate incident. Uh, many times they just, they have a lot of discretion. So, yeah. So if we're trying to target who is viewing it, um, yeah, just going back to, will the police really view it differently? And um, if they do, then maybe it is worthwhile, certainly. Yeah, and perhaps we should uh, look to the state, and I don't remember off the top of my head, I have to look at my notes somewhere, where there's other, there are other states that go with the bias motivated. Yeah, to see if that's made a what, difference. Right, yes, right, yes, right. and to do that research and, um, yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, so, one question that I have, which yeah. is not exactly related to the bill, but it's been, I'm curious about it. The way that we have the duties and obligations split up between your commission and the AG's office, yeah. is that how it's done in all states? Like, it seems so random who has what and yeah. why, and I'm just curious if that... Every state is different. Okay. Every state is different. Some um, do house discrimination within the state, like an AG's office, and some of them are housed in a separate entity, too. Uh, when they gave jurisdiction to the Attorney General's office's civil rights unit to have jurisdiction over employment, they realized that the state has to also represent the state, and so they needed another entity to deal with it when there was a conflict of interest, and then it just made sense. To, for the Human Rights Commission to do that. But could we have had a statute that says all employment discrimination cases are handled by the HRC? Sure. The conflict only exists because we, we gave it to the AG's office. Well, yes. Right, because it seems like, okay. Yes. Because yeah. they have to represent the, um, the state. And yeah. so even in looking at themes and gathering stuff, it seems like we've made it more complicated because you and Julio have to continue to sort of talk through what are you seeing and how does this affect So yeah. I just wonder if there's anything that we've done about that. I appreciate you trying to steer us in the direction of bills that could make a difference yeah. and you don't know if part of your um, authority or ability is to have like a legislative priority list Absolutely, okay. sure. Of yeah. like what you're hoping to see. Absolutely, yes. And I would also refer you all to the annual report the Human Rights Commission submitted this year that made some recommendations to the legislature about bills that we do see as being uh, helpful. And so I know that this bill was introduced with the best of intent. And uh, I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm grateful to be here to have an opportunity to even testify about it, and none of the concerns that I've shared today are even concerns that I would, would suggest you kill the bill. I think it was more of let's just be mindful and <coughs> proceed slowly on this, and also if we're taking up uh, committee time and energy, then there are also probably a lot of other important bills that do, I know for sure at this point, do have an impact. Right. That, yeah. I think that's super helpful. Yeah. The last um, question I have for you is, is it appropriate for us to ever have a joint hearing with HRC? Because maybe that would end up being more inclusive. I, I, I'm very, so there's the what legislation we put forward mm -hmm. and how we include the right stakeholders so that we're not sure. sort of being part of the problem. Yeah, ab absolutely. Okay. Yes, the HRC is definitely open to 
to working with the legislature in any way that you see that would be helpful. Um, I've had other legislators approach me about, I have to take testimony about this issue. I happen to be the chair who is a male, and I this is an issue that impacts women, and I really want to be cognizant of mm -hmm. that. And I go, that's wonderful, because I'm, I'm okay. we're more than happy to help about yeah. that. Yeah, so I think that's wonderful, and there, I'm sure there are many opportunities. Don't hesitate to reach out to me. You certainly know that I won't hesitate to reach out to you <laughs> if I think anything's important that I want everyone to be mindful of. And um, like I said, our annual report does suggest some uh, recommendations that I think are, would be helpful to um, those, are Vermont's those, most vulnerable. Those were the ones agreed upon by the commission, you know, at our last meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I just Oh, that's okay. I knew you knew. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now our colleague, Mark Cusett. To do, um, and like Susanna, Susanna can't. She can't. She just sent me an email saying she had things come up. She can't be here. Okay. Um, do you know if Mark will be? Mark told me two or after. Two or after. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Break um, down. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's take a break and come back at two to, right. to hear from Mark. All right. Great. So we can look at the schedule. Yeah. yeah. All right. Hello, Mark. Hello. Hi, Mark. So, this is Maxine. Uh, let's see, can we? Uh, barely. Could, but, hello? 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 Mark? Mark, can you hear me? Can I uh, try to call you back? I, I, mean, I just I can't hear anything that's happening right now. I'm just going to try to call call back into this number. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you really can't hear that, but you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens. Sam, if it's helpful. Well, we can hear him, which is great. I, I hate that when that happens. You know, you you're on the call and you use some Bluetooth or something, and you're just talking away, and then all of a sudden you go. Hello. Hello. Hi, Mark. Is this better? Hi. Is this better? It is. It's kind of choppy, though. Okay. Well, let's let's try it. <laughs> um, hi, this is um, this is Maxine Gren. Welcome. Uh, we're here continuing our testimony on H four ninety six. And um, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And good afternoon, Madam Chair and House Judiciary Committee. Uh, for the record, Mark Hughes, uh, coordinator uh, for the Racial Justice Alliance. <clears throat> I'm sorry I couldn't be with you this afternoon. I woke up pretty sick this morning. This is kind of the first time I've been sick for a while, so I don't really know how to handle this, but I think I'll make it. Well, um, we, we appreciate you calling in. and mm -hmm. um, so. Thank you. Yeah. So if I cough a little bit or something like that, I, I will try to hold it down. We are having an incredibly difficult time with the premise of H-496 and uh, therefore unable to support it. Um, unfortunately, I'm limited to what is probably less than maybe 10 or 15 minutes to unpack something that, that took <clears throat> years to manufacture and has a direct adverse impact on uh, public safety of uh, the entire state. <clears throat> with, uh, with broad strokes, uh, I'm able to trace the genesis of, of this policy uh, to uh, complaints of uh, former Representative Mortz, who used to sit around that table with you, um, surrounding uh, stalking and harassment by self-proclaimed uh, white supremacists and allegations of biased policing uh, by the Bennington Police Department, uh, who, by the way, still have two civil rights complaints filed against them. Uh, you can refer to a video link that I provided to you uh, that provides complete analysis of the handling of the case uh, from an outside national journalist. You should find that in your 
email uh, the next time each of you check. <clears throat> the AGs, uh, he, initiated, he initiated an investigation which circumvented the unprofessional conduct statute, uh, that is uh, Title 20, uh, 2401, and, tw and 2404. Um, which clearly indicates that uh, it was the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council's responsibility to review any allegations of misconduct perpetrated by the Bennington Police Chief. Um, then, instead of prosecuting Title 13, Sections 1023, 1027, and 1061, as well as 1455, the Attorney General claims that, quote, freedom of speech uh, on behalf of the, the defendant was his, uh, his job to defend himself. <coughs> what happened after that was is that the, the AG, uh, supplanting the specifically assigned responsibilities of the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice advisory panel, implemented a biased incident reporting protocol <coughs> with absolutely no input from impacted communities across the state. Founded on the narrative uh, that the situation in Bennington was the result of law enforcement lacking the apparatus to address hate crimes, the protocol it gave it gave way to the emergence of the use of quote bias as the third option in the absence of the decision to prosecute a criminal or a civil infraction, <coughs> exacerbating the problem in a number of ways, including. <clears throat> Ignoring the history of racial disparities in the justice system, um, relying on the hope that the state's attorney will make the appropriate decision in routing a complaint uh, from a community member. That is, that decision whether to route it to the AG, the, the HRC, the ACLU, the Civil Rights Commission, so on. It lacks the oversight. Um, it fails to take into account potential mis uh, misconduct by police. It also supplants the responsibility of the Racial Disparities Advisory Panel uh, to implement a public complaint process, as I indicated previously, and it removes control of the access to the data associated with the process. <clears throat> I think um, we're starting to control, we're starting to understand how important access to data is within the justice system. <clears throat> the Attorney General himself, he introduced S-132, uh, an act relating to hate, crime, hate crimes and biased incidents, which uh, seeks to give the Attorney General broader investigative powers in civil matters <coughs> and establishes a working group of law enforcement folks to, quote, define biased incidents uh, to establish best practices for responses establish a reporting system and develop training. The following day, Julio Thompson introduced in this committee the proposed policy before us, which builds on the weaponization of the term bias by seeking to rename Title 13, 14, 55 from a hate-motivated crime to a bias-motivated crime. Essentially, it defines civil penalties with the language from the precise criminal law that was not prosecuted in Burlington, Title 13, 1061. Now, it's worth noting here that S-132 was recommitted to Senate Judiciary somewhere around the third reading <coughs> last year. When I offer to you a memo provided by myself on behalf of the Racial Justice Alliance on March 25th of 2019, which is also one of the attachments that I sent in the email to the entire committee. It was sent to Representative Sheena Comer and, and Senators Ingram, Lyons, Pearson, Sarinkin, as well as the entire House Government Operations and Judiciary and Senate Government Operations uh, um, and uh, Senate Judiciary and Government Operations. Uh, I again ask that it be introduced as testimony. Now, notably, in this memo is this statement, <clears throat> and I quote from this 
March 23rd memo last year sent to the aforementioned, sufficient laws exist to address simple assault, disturbing the peace, stalking, and hate crimes. Civil injunctive relief is also available. The laws must simply be equally prosecuted. The amendment to S-132 that was adopted on March 19th in 2019 removed Section 1, Title 13, 1466 in its entirety. The removal of the pre-existing language in Subsection A withdraws the Attorney General's ability to impose a civil penalty or injunctive relief. H-496 in House Judiciary is proposing the use of language from Title 13, 1062 to create civil penalties and changing our low standard hate crime statutes, Title 13, 1455, to a biased motivated crime bill. None of this is helpful in the quote. I'd like to also hear from record a memo from the group impacted, um, a group uh, of uh, impacted community members. Uh, they include uh, Stefan Gillum, the president of the Wyndham County NAACP, uh, Tabitha Paul Moore, the president of the <coughs> Rutland NAACP, uh, Sha'an Moyer, the founder of I Am Vermont 2, uh, Wei Wang uh, of the LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont, Emily Freedom of Black Lives Matter Vermont, Wasik Fawar, founder of Vermonters for Justice for um, Vermonters for Justice in Palestine. Um, Chief Rich Hoshu, uh, I'm sorry about that name. Hoshu, uh, Commissioner of Vermont Commission on Native uh, American Affairs. Amanda Garza, founder of Vermont Coalition for Ethnic and Social Equity Studies and now Outreach and Policy Coordinator for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. Curtis Reed, uh, Director of Vermont Partnership for Vers Fairness and Diversity. Don Stevens, uh, Chief Little Hagen Band in Kusa, Abenaki Nation. Sheila Linton, the, the Root Social Justice Center. And Marita Canedo, Migrant Justice. Notable from this memo, which you should also have as a third attachment, is this paragraph, and I quote, furthermore, while the creators of H-496 express good intent, we feel that the bill is fundamentally flawed in regards to its proposed verbiage. For instance, excuse me, the exchanging the words hate to bias places people of color and other marginalized groups at risk as it unbolts the door, letting those in power define and thus persecute based on majority perception of what constitutes bias. It's not uncommon nor a precedent practice for the most potent bureaucratic structures to utilize gray language to promote their own agenda uh, at the expense of the disenfranchised, thus crafting a weapon with no owner to be used by us or against us. <clears throat> End of quote. <clears throat> In closing, um, I am prepared to take questions, and um, I've got a, a couple of ideas uh, that I wanted to share with you just prior to that. Um, so the question really, because with all good intent, what we're trying to do is we're trying to protect vulnerable communities across Vermont. The challenge with uh, the relationship of African Americans, in particular, with to um, to uh, the law enforcement community and the justice system itself, our relationship is that racial disparities don't just exist in the justice system as it pertains um, to our prosecution, but also our defense. And what we see here is this a very um, serious minimity snicket situation that is just un unraveled in front of us. And, and it's unfortunate because it has created a distraction 
um, is uh, turned our attention from areas where we can be productive in protecting lives of those who are the most vulnerable. <clears throat> it's unfortunate because the justice system was left unchecked in Bennington. So when the representatives from Bennington and the senators from Bennington introduced these two bills at that time, in light of the, cir the circumstances that were unraveling in, in Bennington, when the Attorney General introduced this so-called uh, bias incident reporting protocol, <clears throat> there should have been a fail-safe in the system that protected us, and we call that civilian oversight law enforcement. So, so if not this, then what? You know, there are some things that the legislature can do to make us safe. This policy is not one of them. We're calling for the withdrawal, withdrawal uh, of the bias-related incident reporting protocol because it doesn't make us any safer. We didn't have anything to do with its construction and you've heard all of the impact that it has on us adversely. Um, just as we said, just as we asked last year, in the middle of the 25th of March, we are yet calling for the withdrawal of H-496. Uh, as I said, S-132 has been recommitted uh, to uh, Judiciary Committee of the Senate, and that was uh, I believe it was right, right about, right about the time it was getting ready to go for a third reading. <clears throat> uh, I, I think that the coordination of consultation with impacted communities um, is very important, and that's something that, that I think that the legislature should play a part in, or at least um, effectively oversee. We know that there was a mandate that was placed on the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel uh, to interact with communities. <clears throat> so we really yet to see that. Um, we also we, we also strongly recommend the continued expansion of the Human Rights Commission. Um, they are the apparatus that essentially protects every everyone in this state that's not a white a white cis man. Uh, we need to rely upon them and equip them accordingly. Uh, this, none of this stuff is new. Um, just because what happened in Bennington <coughs> happened, just because there was a narrative that was created that would cause us to potentially look in the other direction, doesn't mean that as a state for the last 243 years, we haven't been equipped to deal with um, the things that we're dealing with right now. We just need to make the system that exists work and when it doesn't call it call it into accountability mandate the use of force data collection policy and training um, uh, mandate use of force data collection policy and training that would be h-464 on um government operations wall right now i believe that has been taken up and i do believe there will be further testimony as early as this upcoming friday we call on your support Expand upon justice system data collection. You have on your wall, and I think a week ago began uh, discussing H-284. Strongly urge the continuance of collection across the remainder of the justice system. Conduct public hearings for civilian oversight of law enforcement. Article 5 and 6 of the Constitution says you work for us, and uh, it also says that we hold law enforcement accountable through you. Rule 25, the House Rules, state the government operation has that oversight authority. Um, it is our opinion that it, it must be um, in deep uh, collaboration with the Judiciary Committee. If this occurs, um, we've been calling for public hearings for civilian oversight of law enforcement for the last three years. <clears throat> the conversation usually relegates to a fair and impartial policing policy discussion. <clears throat> Conduct implementation hearings on Act 9 
in Act 54. We know that we've just appointed a racial equity director who has only the support of an unpaid panel It has more work than five people can do for the next five years. We gave her everything except for a cape. It is imperative that now we begin to look towards funding that, that office and, and growing that capacity if we're serious about the dismantling of systemic racism across the state and further um, with Act 54, the implementation of Act 54, it's not just the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel. If you recall, in this, uh, this, this uh, policy was sourced from your committee. There was also an attorney general in the Human Rights Commission task force which issued a scathing report on the state of Vermont in terms of the racial disparities across all government systems, including housing, employment, health services access, economic development, and the criminal justice system. So it would be appropriate in now being over two years since that report has been out, then we would revisit the progress that's been made there. Remove the Attorney General from the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. This may seem a little curious. However, <clears throat> at all times when it seems as though there needs to be a little bit of oversight to ensure that things are going down the proper track via the implementation of policy, the, um, the, um, the oversight of uh, various law enforcement practices, uh, the investigation of uh, law enforcement agencies, use of force across the state and whatnot. This, the Attorney General is generally called in as a quote unquote third party, he's interested third party. And you know, I've discovered testimony from Rick Gauthier himself who pushed back on S-132 um, because the Attorney General is really only, quote, one vote on the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council, and it would make him a, quote, super vote within that construct. It's important that the Attorney General, if he is called upon to oversee various aspects of law enforcement, that he is not a part of the Criminal Justice Training Council, that he is separate from the Criminal Justice Training Council. This would go on. And finally, remove Nancy Sheehan from the State Police Advisory Commission's chairmanship. She has been appointed and reappointed. And very few people that I've spoken to, they don't real I mean very few people that I've talked to about this, they they um they don't know, they don't know that uh, she's uh, that she's actually a part of the law firm here in, in Burlington in, in her practice to city law enforcement folks on a, on a regular course. So I, I guess, um, <clears throat> sorry I got distracted there, but I guess what, I'm, what we're looking at here is, is uh, she, there's, no, there's no possible way that we can expect impartiality from a lawyer who defends law enforcement folks on a regular basis in the course of her regular job during the day. Uh, and in the place where the chair of the preeminent civilian oversight law enforcement apparatus, uh, civilian oversight law enforcement apparatus in the state, this, this apparatus oversees one third of the law enforcement officers in the state who cover 90% of the land mass in the state. And she is an attorney in the regular course of her job that defends law enforcement officers. <coughs> Not to mention the fact that she's also a partner in, in the law firm of TJ's uncle. So we started with this particular uh, piece of legislation, I think, on a false premise. And uh, we just think it's a bad idea with what this is and what it represents in its very premise. And uh, I'm asking you to shut it down. Oh. I'll take your question. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark. Uh, Questions? So, so Mark, I'm going to have to ask the um, the direct question. This is Coach Christie. 
Um, speaking to other, we've asked and invited others uh, to participate, you know, in discussing this bill anew. Uh, and not all of the uh, witnesses have appeared as yet, uh, but invitations have gone out to pretty much all of the folks that were on that um, original uh, memo. Uh, and we're hearing different um, um, positions, you know, um, about the bill and its concept and what it may or may not do uh, to uh, strengthen options for disenfranchised folks. Um, I, th I think in all, all fairness, um, we need to hear from the rest of the folks uh, involved in the original uh, list, uh, and you know, before we let's say just uh, conclude the proceedings, so to speak, uh, and that's that's a fair uh, approach at this point. Um, I, at least, you know, I, I would. That's my personal feeling. I'm not sure what the rest of the committees. Uh, feeling is at this time, uh, but I just needed to share that. Thank you, Coach. If I, I might respond, I, I would say that uh, yes, of course. I think it, it makes a lot of sense uh, to, to get a lot of perception, uh, to get a lot of perspectives, rather. Um, and I think that um, it's really important also to understand that. Um, you should expect a lot of um, uh, different um, perspectives. The, the, the message that I read to, to you um, regarding the, um, the concerns about 464, um, where I quoted that, the uh, words can affect the gray language, um, and I listed maybe about 13 folks across the state. Um, the, the reason why I didn't sign off on that, that letter, and this just goes to speak to the differences in, in how, because we're not, we're not, you know, those are vast majority of those folks were people of color, but we're still not a monolithic uh, category. And just like any other piece of legislation that you would uh, consider, you're going to get different perspectives from different people. And I think um, part of the constructs that we've been kind of painted into is quite often folks with political and economic power, that they often expect black and brown people to come in and have this, this you know, unprecedented level of, of consensus on various issues. Well, so, um, we're no different than anyone else. So as, as you know, um, you're going to get different responses. Uh, but what what I was you know thankfully able to share with you as a result of just doing a little research is that those 13 folks are on record in opposition to this bill. Um, and I would invite you um, to um, to call them back in to see if they change their mind. <clears throat> well, well, that's why this is a new round. You know, this isn't the old round of, uh, of testimony, and you're the third or fourth person that's uh, testified in this, you know, round, and requests have gone out to um, the folks. Um, so, well taken. I would, I would also add to that, and, and I, I'm, and I appreciate the, um, the opportunity to, to come back uh, to this full circle is that really that's not the point at all. I mean, I, I, what I believe here is, is that if, if, if you leave these deliberations and, and, and you're not if you're not able to draw conclusions 
uh, based upon what has been laid before you and what public records exist, and there are more. Uh, I, I, I did not think that it was the time to provide you everything you would really need to see in order to draw the conclusions that we have drawn. Uh, certainly, we've given you some homework there. Um, but uh, at the end of the deliberations here, if this does not become an oversight deliberation, then I, I think we have more problems here than we thought. Um, because at the end of the day, um, our communities are less are less safe today as a result of what has transpired in Bennington. Black and brown people in this state are less safe today. And white supremacists are more involved today as a result of this. So if there's going to be some serious work done to protect brown bodies, you know, then it's got to start here. So I'm glad this was uncovered. It was, it was brilliant that this was uncovered. But I think what you're doing is pulling at a thread right now. Selena? Hi, Mark. It's Selena. I hope you feel better soon. And, um, Good afternoon, Gina. Hi. I just wanted to, I, I, I just want to um, reflect back to you what I am hearing, I think. I mean, I appreciate all the priorities that you shared and look forward to continuing to work with you on those and talk to you about those. But with regards specifically to H496, I want to say what I think I'm hearing from you and from some of the previous concerns that were raised and, and just make sure I'm understanding. So it sounds like um, one of the concerns about this approach is that we have that it may um, there's a sense that it may dilute the use of existing laws and tools such as like the hate crime enhancement or stalking laws or some of the other things that you've cited and provide provide like almost like a an off ramp with um, less serious consequences. Am I understanding that concern accurately? That like there might be a, that, that by creating the kind of um, bias motivated crime and the, the civil penalty here that we might be giving prosecutors, law enforcement, the attorney general tools uh, incentive to like not pursue the use of some of the laws that we already have on the books that might have stronger penalties? Is that part of what I'm hearing you say? There are a number of concerns um, because, um, first of all, we can't really look at 496 without looking at 132, without looking at S-132. Again, the Attorney General introduced S-132 before, the day before, the day before um, Julio Thompson came and introduced H-496. The, so there's, there are, these, these bills are bound, they're, you're talking about bias over in the House, and the Senate's defining it, okay? The Senate's over here, they're saying that they're, they're putting together a group, all law enforcement, by the way, of folks so they're going to sit down, and at the top of their agenda, one of the first things they're going to do here, and I'm just looking through the bill right now, page three, is defined by a visitor. So you're, you're over here in the house talking about something that hasn't even been defined. Okay, so I think that there's, there are a number of challenges uh, here with this approach. And, you know, the <coughs> recognition of the term bias is not the least of it. Okay, and yes, I do believe, Representative Coburn, that what you're saying is a part of the challenge that we're faced with here, um, which is why I took you to the genesis. You know, I, I, I find it quite ominous that there was a representative from Bennington, two, two senators from Bennington, and a Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council Executive Director from Bennington that were all involved in this process. Uh, you know, as far as uh, where we are today. 
Um, so I, I, that that makes me a little nervous. Okay, so I don't. I, if I can't trust law enforcement on the criminal side when I'm being prosecuted, what makes you think I'm going to trust them when they're supposed to be protecting me? Okay, so um, this is all quite ominous. You know, when you got four laws on the books down there, that folks are scratching their head trying to figure out why they want to prosecute. Okay, and why is it that all of a sudden the, the lexicon of bias became preeminent and prevalent on the heels of that? Okay. But more specifically towards these particular uh, pieces of legislation, yeah, we, we've got some, as I said before, um, sufficient laws to address stuff like the laws that were prosecuted, like assault, disturbing the peace, stalking, and even hate crimes. They, they are all on the books. The tools that the Attorney General needs to do his job are there. He didn't use them. Um, there's also civil and injunctive relief release that's already available. The laws, they just have to be prosecuted. So again, you know, when you start talking about, you know, this whole, um, I'm down back over to 496, since this is what we're here for. You know, what is it buying us by calling hate crimes, hate crimes, bias, motivated crimes? What is that, what is that doing for us? Uh, you know, the other thing is when you begin to look at, you know, back on page, uh, I think the law is right in front of you, if you go back to page uh, uh, 9 or 10, and you look at section 2, course of conduct means two or more acts over a period of time, so on and so forth, that language is verbatim out of Title 13, 1061, the very law he never prosecuted in Bennington, a criminal law. So, Mark, Mark, this is Maxine. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I appreciate your, your frustration and, and your comments are helpful in terms of um, whether we, whether this is the right response, whether we need legislation, or whether in fact perhaps um, something else. And, um, and many of the things that you referred to certainly are the jurisdiction of, of government operations. And I um, also appreciate what you said about the Senate. We, um, we, we do our work and, and the Senate does their work and, and often we're working on the same things or different things or things, mm -hmm. you know, go, go back and forth. Um, so so your, so your testimony has been, been very helpful to, to help us understand. I'm well, sure you appreciate having the yeah. opportunity. And, and, yeah. uh, and I think um, the, the the, the, the last point I was really making about Section 2 back there, Henry Brad, is, is that, um, you know, this, this language is the exact same language that comes out of criminal code <clears throat> that the Attorney General failed to prosecute in, in Title 13, 1061. It's the exact same language that he failed to prosecute. So what we're doing, uh, Representative Colbert, is yes, just as you said, we're changing hate crimes to bias incident reporting crimes, and we're also de-escalating criminal charges to civil charges, despite the fact that we didn't, we would not prosecute, he would not prosecute them even when they were criminal. So this entire mess is incredibly problematic. Um, I thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, thank you for being patient with me with the phone call, and I wish you all a great weekend. Thank you. Feel better. Feel better, Mark. Take care. Take care, Mark. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, anyways, I, I guess my uh, I understand where he's coming from, and I think it's pretty clear um, from his research and his perspective. Um, where we should go with this. Or not go. Or not go. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think more of, about where we should go because the, the should go part is old people's feet to the fire that didn't get their feet held to the fire, you know, originally. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's right, right. all he's talking about. Um, you know, as far as the, the 
statutory uh, changes or potential for statutory changes, what we're looking at, you know, is still in question. You know, I, uh, I think, you know, and hearing from the rest of those voices on that list, I think is, is very important. Uh, you know, and from Kyra herself as well, uh, because she's offering testimony from that, you know, from that. And one of the things that, you know, we see even from uh, the HRC's perspective, when board offered her testimony, she spoke about that <coughs> conflict or uh, between the two jurisdictions, uh, one being the AG's office and the, you know, the HRC. So, I mean, some of these are inherent problems and I think until we hear all of the pieces, it's hard to make a decision about anything you know, it's like information. You know, if, if we stop here, that's all we got. But if we hear from the other voices that were on, you know, on the memo, basically, you know, now we will have an opportunity to balance that information. You know, because that's, that's kind of our job. You know, without going to a hearing, uh, hearing from this extravagant list of, of folks is just, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road. Was Bohr on that? Mm -hmm. Was Bohr on that memo? Uh, no. no. Okay. I, I would have guessed no because she didn't, she wasn't nearly as strong against it, so mm -hmm. that would have been my guess. Although I, I did <coughs> hear her say some of the same things mm -hmm. we heard Mark say, mm -hmm. which is, and I went, and it really made me wish I had asked her more of a follow-up question, which is actually, I mean, I heard her say pretty clearly, like, I think we do have a lot of tools in our existing law that just weren't, weren't used in this particular situation and haven't always been used appropriately. And I just, I, I mean, I don't know. If it's plus, I could certainly follow up with her individually about that, but I wish I had asked that question more. And then I think it also, like I heard, they didn't share the same priorities, but I, I definitely heard, and I think if we do have more witnesses in, it would be good to explicitly ask, even if, even if some of the priorities they share aren't really the jurisdiction of our committee, like that, that, that point was really well taken to me of just how much time are you going to spend on this for what the change, what change it really affords versus what more effective, you know, strategies might and pieces of legislation might be. And so it would be pretty interesting to, as we hear from our witnesses, be really explicit about just kind of consistently asking that question. Yeah. And it would be great for us to look at that annual report mm -hmm. and see what their legislative platform was. Well, well, well it is, it's, when you look at the, the bills specifically, a lot of them aren't in our jurisdiction. Right. Uh, there are a number of uh, bills that are. Um, 496 was not on the list of bills we reviewed. Uh, there were, let's see, two, four, six, Data ten, bill. ten um, 12, 14. There were about 16 bills that we reviewed at the last meeting. Um, and So 496, you know, was on the list, and and as she said, she did, you know, we did not decide to um, speak against it um, as a commission because it was a commission vote. Um, let's see. 333H, and that's prohibiting discrimination based on an individual's criminal history. Um, you know, that uh, we're good with. Uh, 284 was a yes, and that's here. And those were the only one, two, 
and S-132, of course. So th those were the four judiciary bills. Mm. Yeah. She said she's going to look at these. <coughs> But the thing is, you know, she can't really speak without the, because she works for the commission. Sure. No, I <laughs> So, I mean, that means that all of those bills are going to have to come to an agenda and, you know, she'll have to prepare her recommendations for the commission. And, 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 but, anyways. So it just feels awkward to be a co-signer on a bill that people feel like they didn't have a voice in and that we're doing something to them rather than working with people to come up with well that's want. part that this is part of the reason why the witness list is is what it is and it's the people that were on that list okay because it, initially it was a finite right. you know group that that started that started it yeah and um, it's it's like herding cats sometimes, but the bottom the bottom line is each of those folks and Mark admitted it to to us as well yeah. is you might hear differences of sure opinion, right you know and but it seems like you know. one thing we're going to hear in common is there's worry about some of the ramifications of this bill and people felt excluded from the process so it just seems like the process is as important as the product well, well the, the frustration is Kaya's situation and the fact that all of these bills that were on the books were not addressed by the people who had the authority to yeah. do it and yeah. that is what Mark just clearly it's awful. shared yeah. okay and so you could see where there'd be a question about developing a new piece of legislation right. the when the bills that were there weren't really used. Right. <clears throat> and, and there's more frustration probably about that than there is about anything else in the But then also the hearing lexicon. that this bill might not, we, we could put our energy towards making a bigger okay. difference. Well, well but the, here, here's the rest of the discussion. If we don't hear the other people oh. come to the table, then it puts us in a position where we yeah. don't hear that. I, I agree. It just and, feels and that's, yucky. That's all. Well, well it's, it is yucky right. stuff. Yeah. It's yucky stuff for people who don't have to deal with it every day. I, you right. know, and and when you when you're in the middle of it, yeah. and you're on the phone with these folks, and you're in the meetings, and on the panels, and going to the things. Right. And you know it's it's a whole different you know like right. piece, and and that's not to uh, to short sell you know like the work of you know of our committee. What I'm hoping to achieve through us listening to all of these voices is to hear, you know. Because if if, this, if we stop this bill, you know, right this right. minute, yeah. then we won't hear the other people's perspective. Okay, right. even even if it's partially there, not there, right. there, whatever it might be. But I think, in all in all fairness, to those folks that were on that on that list, and, and that's where the witness list came from. Basically, are the folks that are on that, you know, on that bill. So it'd be right to assume that we're probably. Did, did Kaya's like, did you get anything from Kaya? I've never heard from her. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm happy to give this a real quick idea of what we're going to hear from Kaya, because I talked to her on the phone this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, that there are real problems with this bill, and that's great that we're hearing about those. That's, I still consider, yeah, I understand the concept of process, but I think there's as much a misunderstanding of how bills are introduced and, and what the bills are there for I mean, yes. to get a conversation going. Mm -hmm. This is the process. Right. Now, in, in many cases, yeah, it's great if you have coordinated stakeholders who are coming together mm -hmm. to come up mm -hmm. with with an idea that we then run with. We do that. Oh, I certainly do that. 
but in other situations when there's not coordinated stakeholders out there, you put something out and this kind of focuses attention. Uh, you know, th I mean, th and this was certainly never has been meant to really be resolving anything. It's some right. incremental changes provide some things. In any event, yeah, and, and we'll hear directly from, I'm assuming that that'll be part of her written testimony explaining what the issues are with this. But there are, and I agree with her, that there are, that she pointed out some very important issues that, for instance, uh, the big one is that <coughs> a situation where somebody is being victimized by harassment, well, that harasser can turn this around and, and use this and sue the victim because the victim is uh, striking out against the exercise of my First Amendment rights to harass you. So, I mean, this could actually be used as a tool uh, by a harasser. And I, you know, it makes sense. But she also said that there's an idea that this could be a vehicle for and it actually wouldn't change it radically, uh, which is interesting, or not necessarily radically. Um, where this, it, and it could resolve what Brenda's uh, issue is as well, or one of the things that uh, Brenda Ch Churchill raised, uh, that this could be something that only that a state's attorney or an attorney general can bring an action against somebody uh, for violation of somebody's constitutional rights. They already can kind of do this, but it gives them a <coughs> civil option instead of a misdemeanor option or a criminal option. Right now, the criminal option is hate crimes, and there's other threatening, there's stalking, there's all these kind of other things. And, and there is even a civil option in, in the discrimination <coughs> that we have, but this would spell it out a little bit better. Uh, and, and by doing that, this couldn't be a tool used by a harasser unless the AG becomes somebody who harasses people. Um, and you could put in here as a civil remedy uh, referral to restorative justice. So. I think that's worth pursuing, maybe in, in this as a vehicle. I don't know as far as timing, if we let everybody else come out and throw their eggs against this one first, and then come out with something that, well, here's an alternative that hopefully addresses well, some of these issues. That's part of the process, you know, and I guess for, for us, there's still that question that, you know, it, it's like an open sore, basically. And it, it isn't so much this bill, you know, as it's the incident. You know, people have not, you know, they've not healed from that whatsoever. You know, it's as, it's as open to ruin as, as you can get. You know, it hasn't scabbed over. You know, sometimes, I hate to be so graphic, but, it, you know, it, it's, it's, an, it, it's still there. And you can sense it, you know, in, in Mark's research and all of his research has gone towards what did they do that they could have done? Or what, you know, in that, in, in some of what Kaya, you know, talked about, you know, like two, you know, is that. But you notice she came back around in some of her conversation about this could, and even Brenda did. And I think hearing the just coulds are just as important is hearing that people didn't do what they were supposed to do with the old stuff. Right. I just, I would like if if this is a tool that would be of value. Right. Uh, however, this is to that situation. If it's an additional tool, I mean, we can't necessarily control the discretion of law enforcement and states attorneys on whether they use the tool. Mm -hmm. uh, the way we control that is what we're trying to do. In my view, is is shed light on. Having mm -hmm. the transparency, mm -hmm. and hopefully through the political process, since the state's attorneys are elected, that can be remedied. But you know, this is potentially an additional tool. It's not mm -hmm. a tool yet, from mm -hmm. what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. But perhaps it can become one of the tools. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> this is the icky part. <coughs> Sorry, Mr. Yeah, we have to do what I was expecting. Yeah. So, anyway. More work to do. Right. A lot more. <laughs> yeah. this is, yeah. If it were easy, yeah. it would have been done already. This is just part of the process. Right. I mean, when you yeah. when you go and you sign on to some of these bills, you think you're going somewhere where people want you to go, and, and it's not. You get beat up a little bit, and then you, 
you tweak it a little bit, right? I mean, that's part of this process that that happens in this room. Yes. Yeah. 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 Minutes. Okay. Five minutes. Alright, so, anyway, okay. thank you everybody. So, thank you. yeah, so again, um, I won't be here next week, but yeah. I'll be checking in. Nice <coughs> you. Yeah, thank you, and so, the time and, will and be your chair. Or? Yeah, and just so everybody knows, um, if you can be here for 9.30 yeah, on Tuesday you. morning, um, it's the uh, Martin Luther Day, uh, Martin Luther King Day commemoration that um, Chief Justice Ryber comes in with a guest, and this year it's the Honorable Anna Blackburn Rigsby, uh, Chief Judge, District of Columbia Court of Appeals, and um, and she's coming in just to talk about, I, I believe, her take on uh, Martin Luther King and what it's all about. So 9.30 Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. So, in this Maybe room? Justice. I think we have some materials. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't see that. Um, all right. So, thank you. Yeah.